I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This regular scheduled meeting of the Board of Education in District 303 will come to order. Mr. White, if you call the roll, please. Bill? Here. Oheimer? Here. Howard? Here. O'Neill? Here. Rui? Here. Ridley? Here. Allison Reedy? Here. All members of the Board of Education are present. Our first order of business is the approval of minutes of the Student Achievement Committee of March 20th, the Policy Committee meeting of March 31st, the regular board meeting of March 31st, and the closed session of the regular board meeting of March 31st. Second. Motion for approval by Mrs. Hoheimer. Second. Second by Mr. O'Neill. Those minutes are bound starting on page eight of the supportive material. Are there any additions or corrections? We have a motion and a second. Mr. White, if you call the roll, please. O'Heimer. Aye. O'Neill. Aye. Bill. Aye. Howard. Aye. Rui. Here. Aye. Sorry. Wrigley. Present. Allison Reedy. Aye. Motion carries. Minutes are approved. Communications, public comments, and participation. First item is board applause. Mr. Hill. Uh, back in, let's see, what day was this? On Saturday, April 12th, the uh, Peoria, um, the Greater Peoria Sports Hall of Fame held their 33rd annual induction banquet. Uh, we had uh, the Pekin High School 1993 boys golf team that was recognized there, and also Cole Henderson won the Male Athlete of the Year Award for 2013. So congratulations to the 1993 state golf team and to Cole Henderson. Mr. O'Neill. And I would just like to encourage all those seniors particularly that have worked so hard for 12 years or better that they stay at it for the next few weeks. It's not time to slump off. This is Um, I got an email um, this past week, and it's, it was an email for a 5K memorial walk run for Shufflin for Schaefer, for Dean Schaefer, uh, a PCHS grad who was killed in action April 19, 2012. Um, it's a 5K walk run at, the, at Coal Miners Park, and I would encourage our community to come out and support this worthy cause. All proceeds will go to the General Wayne Downey Foundation. So it's a very worthy cause. I'd love to see everybody out there. Thank you. Mr. Howard. Um, Mrs. Huebner has announced the graduating seniors who will be speaking at the graduation, graduation ceremony, there'll be Jared Ziegenbein and Isabel Lipea. I congratulate these two students for being chosen by the faculty. And on the heels of that, I uh, commend the faculty involved in making the choice because it can't have been an easy choice. I would like to uh, echo Mr. Hill's comments. He took my uh, 1993 golf shout out. So uh, congratulations to that team. Great. I would like to congratulate Mr. Bob Dice and his Auto Tech students for uh, capturing the Middle Line Eye Auto Tech competition again this year. I think uh, I might be wrong, but I think it's three out of four years they won that competition. So congratulations, Mr. Dice Thank and his you. students. Thank you. And you guys got everything covered, so that's good. Uh, student Council Report. Our report today is going to be short and sweet. Um, our senior citizen prom was last Friday, and it was a huge success. We had a blast. It was so much fun. Um, and then on May 17th, we have our pancake breakfast at Applebee's, and half of the proceeds will go to the Ronald McDonald House, and half of it will go to our student council. Um, and you can buy tickets for that at the BFL. And that's all. <laughs> How much are the tickets? Um, I'm not sure. I think $5. I don't know if any of my fellow board members have noticed, but Mallory has a unique ability. She's a person who can smile and speak simultaneously. <laughs> I, I wish I knew how to do that. <laughs> Thank you, Mallory. Uh, Anything else? At this time, I would recognize anyone in the public that would like to address the board on any non-agenda item. If you have comment uh, on an agenda item, I'll recognize you at that time. Our next, we will move on. Our next order of business is the approval of claims. A motion will be in order to pay the monthly warrants in the amount of $1,809,454.69 
per summary information found on page 38 and detailed information further in the agenda. Motion by Mr. Howard, second by Mrs. Hoheimer. Are there any questions or comments on the warrants as presented? Hearing none, Mr. White, call the roll, please. Howard? Aye. Hoheimer? Aye. Hill? Aye. O'Neill? Aye. Rui? Aye. Wrigley? Aye. Allison Reedy? Aye. Motion carries. Warrants can be paid. The district bank balance report, the investment report, and the medical care report, along with the financial statements, are found in your support material. Any members have questions on those reports at this time? Hearing none, at this time I would ask for a closed session regarding one, the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees of the public body or legal counsel for the public body, including hearing testimony on a complaint lodged against an employee of the public body or against legal counsel for the public body to determine its validity. Number five, the purchase or lease of real property for the use of the public body, including meetings held for the purpose of discussing whether a particular parcel should be acquired. And six, the setting of a price for sale or lease of property owned by the public body. Motion by Mr. Howard, second by Mrs. Hoheimer. Mr. Webb, call the roll, please. Howard? Aye. Hoheimer? Aye. Bill? Aye. O'Neill? Aye. Rui? Aye. Wrigley? Aye. Allison Green? Aye. Motion carries, and we will reconvene as soon as we can. Reconvene from closed session. Our next item on the agenda is the consent agenda. It includes employment uh, items. Mr. Tepetis? I'd like to, uh, the administration would like to recommend the following uh, certified staff for employment. Uh, Mike Bone as the new instructional technology coach. Clint Brown as dean of students. Brian Geist as dean of students. Andrew Gillum, teacher for the math department. Randy Leeshight for the teacher in the science department. Meg Mastriani as science teacher. Greg McGinnis as a business teacher for the CTE department. Alyssa Thompson for the science department and Jennifer Travis is a teacher in the math department. Also like to uh, have included as a volunteer for the JROTC program as a chaperone or volunteer, Mary Ann Kruger. You've heard the request from the administration to approve the consent agenda employment and volunteer under 5.21 as presented, including the personnel report, pending background checks as necessary. So moved. Motion by Mr. Wrigley. Second. Second by Mr. Hill. Questions or comments? Ms. Wright, call the roll, please. Wrigley? Aye. Bill? Aye. Oheimer? Aye. Howard? Aye. O'Neill? Aye. Rui? Aye. Allison Green? Aye. Motion carries. <coughs> Consent agenda is approved. Item 5.3, this is a report from the administration on the directive elective program. This time I'll introduce Melissa Bloom and Seth Mingus. students coming to us in high school. 
high school not prepared to do high school work um, and not prepared to meet college for readiness standards. Um, and we also knew, obviously, at the time, which the state has, has pretty much come out and said as well, that their ISAT scores were, were not at all correlated for our purposes as a high school and the way that we are measured as a high school, and that ultimately these students were going to be taking the ACT. And hopefully, most of them had plans that were dependent on how well they did on those exams. So at that point in time, we, we also were looking at our failure rates for our freshmen students. And we knew that our failure rates, particularly in our algebra one courses, were much higher than we preferred them to be. Um, they were, for that group, that 2009 to class 2013, sitting around 32% failing after sitting in algebra um, with us for a year. And the students that were doing the best with us were the ones that we taught in-house eighth grade um, in our classes. So students were struggling with their reading intensive courses. We were hearing a lot of background from our English teachers, our social studies teachers, our science teachers, anybody who had a very writing or reading intensive program that these, these students just we have got to interview. So at that point in time, our English and math departments went out and really kind of just visited different schools to see what kinds of things other schools, other high schools were doing. We were pretty much at the cutting edge, to be honest, as far as the high school RTI program, and, and Mr. Mingus will talk about that in a little bit. Um, so the, it was difficult, honestly, to find high schools that were piloting much of anything as far as how to address college and career readiness gaps between eighth and ninth grade. We did find some. And most of those schools at that point in time were basically running an enrichment type of support program where their students came to them as ninth graders and they were all, in some cases, all of their ninth grade students were put into literacy or reading courses um, or doubling up in math curriculum. And so that's the path that we decided to go with um, and tended to pilot it with the class of 2014. So that's this year's seniors. and. Um, the course was developed by the teachers. We did not purchase a, an out of a can or a box type of program um, as they worked with other schools that were running similar programs. So the objectives when we started the pilot for 2014 were to help our students obviously be more prepared to meet ACT's rigorous college and career readiness standards as they came to us. And then as time has rolled with this program, obviously we have been changing the program too, uh, as we implement common core state standards into our curriculums. The, the program itself has changed um, to do that. We also wanted to strengthen their core literacy and numeracy skills. We realized that those skills don't just affect an English class, don't just affect a math class. If students aren't strong in literacy, they're going to struggle across all of their high school courses really the same holds true for university. And we wanted to provide students with skills to, to see if we could affect in a positive manner some of those failure rates that we were seeing. We really, and this is still a huge focus for us, are finding ways to keep the freshmen on track. Because obviously, I think most people know that research shows that for predictors for, for success for graduation, freshman year is really very tiny, I apologize, but I know that from the board this could also be the exact materials so you may have seen this already. But this, the students historically enrolled in the enrichment program were direct elective when it was started. Um, the piloting class of 2014, so this year's seniors, came to us, uh, again, below benchmarks. When this class started with us, they came to us at 40% below benchmark in English, 55% below benchmark in reading, and 60% below benchmark in so this was the first class we piloted at that point, direct elective or enrichment with. We ran the pilot somewhat differently in the English course that year. Being a pilot, we started small. Um, we pulled some of the students who were in our English one courses to pilot this. Um, whereas now, as you'll see, we've expanded this program after the class of 2014 success with it. We expanded to all students in our English curriculum who are not in a one A or one double A course. And so all of those students in some manner get an direct elective or enrichment course. And all of our math students, um, with the exception of our special education students and our um, students that are in integrated algebra or students who are meeting the benchmark credit. 
the data from the classes of uh, 2015 to present would show that those students came to us on average, uh, in some cases, even lower than last 2014. 35% English, 51% below the reading, and they unfortunately came to us as an average of 70% below the net. So we are, we are not seeing, um, we're not seeing that the students are coming to us more prepared. Uh, and so therefore we've had to kind of up our ante as far as what, what we do to get the students where they need to be in three years time when they take the ACT, four years by the time they graduate. And one of the ways that, that we have upped our ante or, or that schools have to address the gaps that students or gap, achievement gaps that students have when they come into their building or the achievement gap that they have once they are in the building is through the RTI process. And I know that many of you, if not all of you, have, have seen this triangle and are somewhat aware um, of what RTI is or, or maybe very aware of what RTI is. But just a quick review or refresher, um, RTI has three different tiers and they're represented there on the triangle. And tier one is the first tier. And the Illinois State Board of Education defines a tier one intervention as an intervention that all students receive. It's found in the core instruction. And differentiation is provided in the classroom as needed. So um, to, to make it very simple, tier one interventions are interventions that, that all of our kids receive. And, and it's received in a variety of ways, um, whether it's in the classroom, could even be social emotional interventions that students may receive in um, all, all students assemblies that our counselors do that through advisory period or different avenues that they may do, they may have. Tier 2 interventions as defined by the Illinois State Board of Education, supplemental instruction in addition to the core for a group of students determined with universal screeners to identify groups of students who have some risk of not meeting grade level standards and who have common needs. Interventions are designed to address multiple students' needs and are delivered in a predetermined format. The English enrichment and math enrichment that Mrs. Bloom just addressed is one of our tier two interventions. It's an academic tier two intervention. And just like tier one with the social emotional, we also also have social emotional tier two interventions and, and some other academic tier two interventions um, that we offer. Tier three interventions, that would be the red, the top of the pyramid, the fewest students receive tier three interventions. Illinois State Board of Education defines tier three interventions as interventions at a higher level of inten intensity and are done in a small group, two to three students, or individually, tailored to each specific student's needs. Tier three interventions primarily are going to be used, as, as I just said, with small groups, um, oftentimes they're with individuals, and the primary purpose for tier three would be for the identification of potential special education services. And we also offer those here um, in an academic, and we offer tier three in social emotional. Because of the number of students that we have come to us behind, the RTI process is reflected basically immediately upon entering, and even before the students are entered here as freshmen in the freshman scheduling process. And so that is difficult to read, but in order to, to make sure that everyone is clear on how students, how we use RTI for our freshmen, I want to take a couple minutes to just go over our freshman scheduling process, and, and that is something that, that really begins in January, late December. And that begins with me going to the feeder schools, and, and I will meet with students at the feeder schools during the school day. And the purpose of my meeting is I go over the Explore test, which is the universal screener we use here at PCHS, is Explore, an eighth grade Explore, ninth grade Plan, in 10th grade, and then ACT their junior year. That's, that's our universal screener. So I meet with the students during the school day, and I go over the Explore test, what that test is, what those results will be used for, get the students some test, take, some test taking tips, and go over a variety of, of PCHS related things. And really, that, that's my primary purpose, but I address any questions the students have at that time because some of them are nervous about the transition to the high school. In addition to meeting with the students during the school day, I go to the feeder schools, and, and I go to all of the feeder schools with the exception of the two private schools at night. So I go at night and I meet with the parents. And I go over basically the same thing that I go over with the students. I just go over a little bit more with a, with a, with a parent lens instead of a student lens. So I gear it toward scheduling and concerns or questions that the parents may have regarding Explore, regarding Directed Elective, regarding Double English, regarding any schedule thing. But Directed Elective and, and the way we use Explore and those scores and what benchmarks mean and a lot of what Mrs. Bloom talked about, I go over with the parents and the students so they all know 
what they're going to be doing, what the expectations are, and how we're going to use those results when we get them. Students come in January, and, and there are two weekends where we test. We break them up basically as, as even as we can. We get about 250 the first weekend, 250 the second weekend, and they take the Explore test. And we typically get those results back uh, by the end of January or January or early February. Sit down uh, with Mrs. Owens and go over the, the numbers and, and where our students are and, and how many students are in what classes. And the way we determine that is looking at their scores. Students who are below benchmark are going to be scheduled for English 1, Algebra 1, and then they are obviously going to have the directed elective. And then there are your other required freshman courses that students will take. And we go over all of that in a meeting in February with the parents and their students. And, and we are very happy. We've done it a different way for the last two years. And, and we've had so many students and parents at the meeting that we've had to go from one meeting to two meetings, which was our goal was to involve parents in the scheduling making process instead of always having students. We wanted parents to be aware of that. Or in the past, we would go and talk to the kids at the school, and, and then there was a, a breakdown of communication, I think. And, and we've tried to to do a better job of that. Once we have the scheduling that the parents have been involved in and we've been involved in, I do send all the student scores to the feeder schools and ask the principals for feedback on whether or not this is an accurate depiction of their student. And if principals email me back and say, it looks like Johnny had a bad day, they're really a, a top kid, or, or um, you know, so-and-so is better, should be in an in a upper level track, we always honor their request and take what they say seriously and move them up to the level that they want to. Our counselors will go to the feeder schools and meet with students who can't attend, um, and, and we make any changes that would be appropriate. One thing that I, I would like to note is we have adopted the philosophy that the student wants to move up a level, we allow them to move up a level. I mean, we look at it that if they want to challenge themselves, we will allow them to challenge themselves, whether that's moving from integrated to regular, regular to A track, or an English A to double A. The one thing that we do require when students move up is that if they tested in algebra one or English one, we require that they stay in algebra or English, algebra one or English one, at least through the first semester. And then if they move up to A track, yeah, English enrichment. I keep saying director left, and I'm sorry, have it. Um, if they move up to A track and they are doing well in their English class or their algebra class and doing well in the enrichment class, we have moved students out of director elective at the semester. A little bit about our two classes. In our literacy enrichment class and our math enrichment class, they, they have the same idea behind them, but we go about them in, in two somewhat different ways, and, and how, we do, how we go about them works. Um, English enrichment is a course that's taken as a support for all students who are in English 1 or English 2, and obviously those students who tested into English 1 or English 2 that have elected to move into English 1A or English 2A. It's not just a class that we use to catch students up, but also to enrich them, enrich their understanding of literacy, and expand their understanding of literacy skills. It's our hope that students who take literacy enrichment not only will improve their English score, but it's our hope, and, and we have found this to be true, that it will improve their scores, across, their, their scores across the board as far as all of their academic uh, classes that they take. Literacy is not just an English thing. Literacy is a, it's an every class thing. I mean, you use literacy in, in science, you use it in social studies, you use it in career and technical education. There are lots of different activities and instructional ideas that take place in literacy enrichment, but I think the best way to describe the course may be to talk about two different things. that They're, they're broad things, but they're two things that take place and then maybe narrow that down a little bit. One of the things we use in literacy enrichment is um, Reading Plus. Reading Plus is one of the only interventions that's listed or that's cited, I guess, in the What Works Clearinghouse for high for RTA interventions for high school. So it is, a, it is, I guess, for lack of a better term, backed by um, What Works Clearinghouse. And Reading Plus is used several times a week throughout the year. And how it works is students take initial, initial assessment to determine their levels. And then the program all basically gives them an individualized set of things that they're going to do to help increase their achievement in a variety of areas. Um, those areas are fluency, vocabulary knowledge, overall comprehension. Students get to choose their reading topics, they get to set goals, and they record their own progress, and they conference with their teacher about those goals and their progress as they go along. Another aspect of literacy enrichment is the direct instruction or the guided practice that's just, that the students are going to do each week, and that's really designed to reinforce the concepts of a variety of literacy-based areas. So decoding difficult tasks, text, 
how to read difficult text, um, and a variety of different reading strategies. And it's our hope that it builds a foundation for literacy and a foundation for enjoying literacy and enjoying reading. During the class, a variety of instructional tech strategies are used, and the class is engaging and motivating for students. And as I said earlier, the goal is to develop literacy skills that will support them not only in their literacy enrichment, not only in their English class, but also in all of the other classes that they're going to take their freshman year, and sophomore year, junior year, senior year, and hopefully when they go on to college or enter the workforce. Math enrichment, while the, the overall goal, which is of math enrichment, which is to support students that are in Algebra 1, Algebra 2. Um, the goal and the idea behind it is the same. The way we go about it is a little bit differently. It, too, is not just a class to catch students up. It enriches them and expands their understanding of content through real-world applications, project-based learning, and student discussions. Probably the biggest difference between literacy enrichment and math enrichment is that literacy enrichment is geared toward all classes that a student may take because literacy is used in all classes. Or math is, is more specific to a math class. So the math enrichment goes along with the daily math lessons that a student may have. So um, it, it, it's prescriptive to fit the instructional needs of the students, but it's going to go, and if you can see the chart and that's not perfect, it kind of follows the flow of the math curriculum. Um, it fosters a positive environment to help build students' confidence and esteem in mathematics, as well as is an understanding that it's okay to make mistakes and that the students need to learn from their mistakes. They receive direct instruction and guided practice. And one of the neat things about our math enrichment class is, is the hands-on activities that they do. And they use a lot of technology in our math enrichment class too. And we have seen success with the students. I think, I mean, adults and students are the same. I like technology and I, and I think the kids like technology as well. Um, the teachers model methods for solving so that the students can, can take a look at what method they like the best we realize that not all students learn the same way, and math enrichment is one of the places where we work to help students discover that as well. Um, they're provided with graphic organizers to increase their problem solving skills, and um, when they do demonstrate content mastery early, we give them extra enrichment activities to continue working toward the mastery of more difficult concepts. When we monitor these enrichment programs, uh, I mean, honestly, we, we have to put out there, too, that we're really in, the students that are sitting in enrichment right now are really our third group of students to go through enrichment, so three years. Um, 2014 data, as I said, was a pilot year, so it wasn't run exactly the same as we've been running enrichment the last few years. So we have two consistent enrichment years to look at, and then the students are currently sitting. So what I, I share with you it has to kind of be taken from that lens too. That this is still a pretty new program for us in, in the grand scheme of longitudinal data. But what we do when we monitor enrichment, um, obviously Mr. Mingus has already talked about the Reading Plus. Because this is literacy and it isn't directly tied to our English classes, um, we, we need to be able to monitor the, the success of this program in some sort of measurable way other than just a local assessment that is over the novel or the writing that was assigned to them in an English class. And so Reading Plus is able to do that for us. And math, it is tied directly to the Algebra 1 Common Course Assessments. And that is where, an area that we have grown in the last couple of years in our Algebra 1 2 curriculum as we've transitioned into Common Core. And our, our faculty has solidified those Common Course Assessments, meaning that they give the same course, they give the same tests we're able to more effectively then be able to see whether or not our enrichment in math is having an impact on what they are learning in their algebra courses. We used to use Carnegie um, tutoring, which was another, it was a technical program, uh, to do this until we got to the point where we had the common assessments in math. We do use Khan Academy just in case that's confusing to people in math. It's not a way of monitoring the enrichment. It's, it's really just a way of giving students individual skills that they may need at the time, which Reading Plus does do for the students, but Khan, Khan doesn't have that assessment component that we tap into. And of course, EPASS is our universal screener that we use at the end of the year. Um, and we do look at that to determine the potential need for ongoing interventions. And obviously, if we continue to look at the trend data of what we're getting and, and what we look like at the end of the year. Um, but we're obviously in a better position after ninth grade year to have some of our other assessments to be able to kind of 
in this picture of what direct elective is doing. And it also helps us grab students who develop a need during their freshman year. I've alluded to some changes that we've made to enrichment since the pilot began, and there have been quite a few changes to enrichment other than just the name. We have found, as, as you saw in the 2014 data, that uh, the students coming to us are continue to be very below benchmark, and that we needed an additional commitment of teacher time and funding to address this continued underperformance of our incoming ninth grade students. We are committed to that. Um, we, we feel like that's our duty, to take the students that we get and, and put them in a position of, of being successful in high school and post high school. Um, so that's something that we take very seriously. We have made improvements in the progress monitoring, as I mentioned, as course, uh, courses have changed. We've changed the direct elective to make sure that it meets the, core, the new course requirements, that we aren't just sitting on a program that, oh, this was great, we did this in three years ago, and things have changed, but that's okay, we're good. That's not our philosophy. As they change, we change the program uh, to make it applicable to what our curriculum is. Uh, we have been more um, conscious of moving students out of direct elective if they are sitting in our English 1A and Algebra 1A classes and, and need to be moved. Um, we look at, at those scores very frequently throughout the year. Um, enrichment, this isn't on here, but enrichment is actually also assessed currently through our RTI program. We have several different RTI committees that meet monthly, and our Tier 2 uh, RTI committee, which is seen overseen by our RTI coordinator. Um, while she does not place students into the program, once the program is running and there are bodies in the seats, she does oversee the success of, of what data we're pulling and we analyze the data and the team meets and we discuss. So I'd say every couple of months we're looking at direct elective data with the RTI team and talking about how things are going and conversing with the teachers and, and just getting some you know touch point, how are things going? for you this year, what do we think we're going to need to change for next year type of things. Um, mentioned using Carnegie. This year, what we're doing differently is piloting summer school English enrichment, um, which we have not done that before, but as Mr. Mingus suggested, because literacy is certainly not just tied to English, and it, it doesn't correlate in the same way that algebra correlates with the enrichment. We'd like to see if we can get the students the skills they need even before they step foot in high school classes during summer, if maybe they will be more successful as they day one as they enter our high school. Uh, plus, it does for the students who have a concern of wanting to have more hours in their day for classes that they'd like to elect to take. For those students, it opens up a possibility for them to do that as well. So we're anxious to see how this goes. And of course, we are collecting longitudinal data now that DE is in its fourth year, but it's our third year as a non-pilot, and that third group is actually sitting in the course right now as a freshman. Okay, so for the data as far as the literacy enrichment goes, um, this is the data that we think you might be most interested in as far as, as what we can pull from this program at this point in time. Uh, we do look at a lot of various data points, as I mentioned, uh, on a fairly regular basis. And when we assess enrichment, um, we, we look at the EPAS scores because they are our end of the year assessment for all of our students. It does correlate to the placement data in that sense. Since we do place students into the program using EPAS scores, we, we recognize that we need to also look at the EPAS scores once we've completed a year or two years, three years with those students. Obviously, by the time a student completes their freshman year, their sophomore year, their junior year with us, there's a lot that goes into an EPAS score outside of just um, an enrichment course. There, there are a lot of variables that go into that. Uh, but we are pleased that when students come to us as they, they have at 40 to 50 percent behind in their English or reading, that we're able to take that group of students and improve their performance levels to oftentimes greater than the performance growth levels of students who came to us meeting. Um, for example, the class of 2014, and again, you have to remember that this class is a pilot class and we did operate this program differently, but our seniors this year, 20% um, of those students who took enrichment 
made more than what we would consider average growth on the ACT over the course of their freshman, sophomore, junior year. So they made more growth than even what is deemed college and career ready. And we can't contribute that all to enrichment, we know that, but, but it was a piece of the puzzle, we think, for those students. For a class of 2015, um, of the students who were enrolled in enrichment and made growth, 45% of those students made more than an average year's growth during the intervention period alone. And for the class of 2016, 39% um, of the students who made growth grew more than a year's worth of growth in the intervention period alone. Obviously, we don't have um, EPAS yet for 2017 students. The thing that I think maybe is more interesting even than the EPAS results, because those, those do start to include a lot of variables as time goes on, are the Reading Plus data that we have now for the class of 2016. You can't read that from this far away, but what you probably can see in the white box is that there's a blue bar on the far left-hand side. And that represents the nearly 80% of the students who when they started English lit or literacy enrichment were behind five or more grade levels in reading when they started that program. So these are freshmen that started this program that were behind more than five years of reading. By the time that program ran its course through the year, the, the number is so minuscule, it, I, it doesn't even register on here that we're more than five years behind. And we got to a point where the majority of the students, I mean, they had not made, they had not caught up five years. It, it's nearly impossible to catch a student up five years worth of behind, being behind in a year. But we had many, many more students who made three years worth of gain. Um, and some, Again, it's not a lot, a lot of students, but about 5% of those students were caught up with their peers who came to us ready to go. And we are proud of that. I think that that shows a lot of work on our teachers' um, ends and on our department chairs' ends and, and the parents and the students because part of literacy enrichment and math enrichment is what the students are willing to put into it. And I think that this demonstrates exactly what we were hoping to see. The data is very similar for the, the math enrichment, and, and I'll start with the graph, and, and again, that is hard to read. But what that graph on the right-hand side represents is, is our current freshmen and our local assessments, a pre-assessment and a post-assessment in, in our Algebra 1 course. And you can see that the, the first one is the pre-assessment, and you can see um, the, the chart, the, high, the bigger the bar graph or the taller the bar, bar graph, the better the students did. So you can see that they didn't do all that well when they came in for the pre-assessment, and that matches what our EPAS data would say, is that I believe Mrs. Bloom said close to 70% of our freshmen coming in this year were below benchmark. And the second graph underneath is, is the post-assessment for Algebra 1, and you can see growth in all five of the areas um, assessed. So, so we're proud of that with our local assessments, and I, and I think that that demonstrates that our students are mastering concepts that they didn't have mastered when they came into our building. The, the other area on the right is basically the same breakdown that Mrs. Bloom gave you for literacy enrichment, just from a math enrichment piece. And I will, I'll, I'll give you the data since it's probably hard to see. Our class of um, 2015 for students enrolled in enrichment, 52% of the students showed positive growth. And of those 52%, 51% of them um, grew more than what is considered average growth during the intervention period. Class of 2016, which would be our sophomores, 44% showed positive growth in their explorer, and 29% of those who made growth grew more than what is considered average growth during the intervention period. I think an important thing to note in the, I guess it would be the third, set, fourth section down there, is that our trend data is showing fewer students failing out for one and two than we had prior to DE. Um, when we went back and analyzed the data, it's, it's fair to say that our failure rates in algebra one and two have dropped 10% as far as students failing algebra one and two, and I think I mean, I know that I have talked to the, the board about freshman failing classes before, and that's, that's something that we are really working toward, um, try, trying to, to work towards, I won't say getting rid of because that, you're not going to do that, but working toward giving freshmen the supports they need in order to pass classes. So director elected has certainly done, has certainly done that. Finally, where we are, and, and maybe more appropriately, where we may be going, 
Um, we're going to continue our focus on our core curriculums and alignment of enrichment with the new Common Core State Standards. Not only are we aligning our curriculum with the Common Core State Standards, I, the feeder districts are as well, and we've had positive articulation meetings with the feeder districts um, in both English language arts as well as math to try to get everyone on the same page and, and begin working toward, I think it's fair to say that our goal would be to, to work with the feeder schools so that we don't have 70% of our students coming in below benchmark when they enter here, and I think that that benefits the students and, and that's what we, we want to do. Um, continue improvement and progress monitoring so that we can drive our core instruction. We look at progress monitoring not only on the students, obviously that's important to do, but we also progress monitor what we're doing so we can continue to improve the core instruction that we do. Um, as Mrs. Bloom said, we are piloting summer school for the literacy enrichment and, and we're hoping that we see positive results with that. And we are having considerations for scheduling to allow more students um, elective opportunities and, and I know some of you on the board have been parts of those conversations through SAC and, and through other um, meetings. And so that's kind of where we are and, and where we're hoping that we're going to be or where we're going. And at this time, we'll take any questions from the board if you have any. I have a ton of questions. All right. I just been scribbling away. First of all, um, my first question is, is you have this child that's a bubble kid. He could go either way. And you're like, should I put him in DE? Should he be in it or should he not be in it? You make that call to maybe the principal of the junior high you came from, you talk to that person and say, hey, you know, what are your feelings? You go, you talk to that person before you make a decision, or do you automatically say, well, he's just, probably we'll just put him in the directed elective because he's on the bubble. The, the students that are placed in the direct elective are placed in the direct elective based on the English or math class that they're placed into, and that is a mathematical formula that we use. And it's a mathematical formula that I know has been used since, since I've been here, where it takes their score, let's just use math because it's easier because there's a math assessment. It'll take their score on the math section of the, of the Explore, it'll look at their overall composite, and, and it's a, a formula, and then it'll shoot out an overall number at the end. And so, for sake of simplicity, let's just use the number 100. 100 is the cut score to go into Algebra 1A. So students under 100 are in algebra 1, students above, at or above 100 are in algebra 1A. Now the bubble kids are, I mean, the question I guess you're asking is what do you do with the 98, 99 type kid? Yeah. 98, 99 type kid are going to be the, the students that are going to go into algebra 1. Um, those are the students that we hope parents or principal says, hey, that student is an A-track student. What, I think A-track should be where you move them. And so we put them in a track and we keep them with the direct elective at least for first semester. So if you're in Algebra 1, you're automatically going to get a direct elective. Correct. And then after first semester, and we did this more this year in 100% truthfulness, we had a lot of parents that approached me, if my kid does really well, will you, uh, will you look at getting them out of English enrichment? And the answer is, they're in a track. If you want to move them up, absolutely we will. I believe I only had two parents at the end of the semester that still wanted that request honored because their student was getting A's in both classes. They, they kind of were like, oh, maybe you were right that that, is, that was a good placement for them. Let's keep it for the rest of the, the year and then we can look at, um, we don't have direct elective sophomore year, but there are other interventions that we do. So if we do honor that, we will move them up. We monitor them for a semester. If we feel that was appropriate, then we have them on direct elective. Okay, my next question. Um, I know algebra one or algebra one is half, more say half the speed of algebra one a. You have a kid that's in algebra one; they do good, they do very well. So they're they're going to get out of the directed and elective. They're going to go to one a, and they're going to be way behind. We've had pretty good success. Uh, level changes are kind of I, I monitor those, and we've had pretty good success with kids moving from one to two a. Um, I think if we get them early freshman year, they do move faster in Algebra 1A, but a lot of what they're going to do first semester in Algebra 1 and 1A, a lot of the concepts are going to be the same. That's especially true. We've been revamping our, our curriculum in math. We've, we've been working um, for the past two years on that. And so you are right. There is a difference in the rigor in the curriculum. But if we get them early from, from 1 to 2A, we've had success with students moving into that. Okay. Um, and you say that, of course, these direct electives, they, they've been developed by the teachers. Uh, are the teachers, are they happy with, with, with the, 
directed electives? Are you having um, pushback? One of the things that, that happens when we meet with those teachers, specifically at those level two RTI meetings, is, is we get that anecdotal feedback. Um, there are always things about our programs that the teachers think we could be doing better, and so enrichment certainly know it, it's, it's not an anomaly. I mean, there are definitely, these changes come about because a lot of times they're brought up by the teachers. Um, but when we ask them if the programs are worthwhile, they have unequivocally said yes. In fact, our algebra teachers, our sophomore algebra teachers, have said, and, and you can't full date on this, but they've said that they feel like the students they get now that have taken direct elective are so much better prepared for their sophomore math curriculums than they had been in the past. And that speaks volumes, in my opinion. Well, forgive me if I'm, I'm misunderstanding this, but didn't we by law have to institute something because of our scores? Sure, I mean, part of, part of this is, is that it does play into our school improvement plan. And the, did the Illinois State Board of Education approve this program? Uh, not in a sense of where they've had to like sign off on we approve enrichment, but they did have to approve our school improvement plan, of, right. which, of which this was a part of. What's, what's the negative? I mean, what do, what do students miss out on if, if they, if they, I mean, have, have we been able to track and data that, you know, they miss this elective that they wanted to take or, you know? What we considered when we started this program was that if students begin to fail courses, especially their core courses, in freshman, in their freshman year, is that that's a vicious cycle. And so that while these students may have wanted to take a plethora of career tech ed classes or to, to take extra science classes, that doesn't become possible once they start to fail their core classes because they have to be repeated their graduation requirements. So it's difficult to say what they would take in place of enrichment if they had the opportunity to, but what we know is that it's decreasing our failure rates. And that in itself opens up additional enrichment additional uh, elective experiences that some students may not have had uh, coming to us as far behind as they were. Uh, we do try to, to continuously talk about, and we're talking about in SAC, uh, in, in a bigger s scheme of things, but how do we continue to make sure that students are exposed to things that they enjoy taking to? Student feedback about this program has been very positive. They enjoy it. Uh, when we talk to students, at the beginning, and they say, there's, there's no way I would have wanted to sit in this class. Usually, by the end of it, we even have students tell us it's their favorite class, because it's fun. Because they get to do fun things in algebra. They get to learn in a different way. Um, and, and it counts as a, an elective credit. Both of the courses do. So it doesn't, um, it doesn't take away that credit they have to earn anyway for a graduation requirement. Our hope is that it's actually opening up additional doors for Go back to uh, Seth when you talked about the, the s scores are sent back to the Peter District principals. Mm -hmm. How much feedback do we get? What's historically? It depends on the Peter school. Um, I mean, some Peter schools will give me very detailed feedback. Um, students' names, who they feel may be placed inappropriately, either too high or too low. Um, some Peter schools, unfortunately, are not as open communication as far as what where their students are. But I send them every year. I encourage feedback every year. Um, and so I, I get feedback from every school, but some schools are better than others at giving me feedback, for sure. Other questions from the board? I just have a question. Um, when you talk about these benchmarks, these are the college and career readiness standards. They're outlined on the Explorer, that's what you're using, right? Correct, yes. And are most of the students that are in Algebra 1, Algebra 2, English 1, English 2, do those students still indicate that they hope to, to go on to college? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Based on the years of research that I think you guys are all involved in with the numbers, the historical data suggests that if there was no intervention with those students, that came in at those bench at those below benchmarks that they would not reach the benchmarks required to be successful in college. Correct. They would not. And that was historically over time. Correct. So 
this program is based on what the, the test, still based on what the test, the, the majority of the kids who say they're gonna go to college in the Midwest to take the ACT, and the Explore test as an eighth grader being the first test that they take, and that sequence of testing to prepare for that junior uh, April test. One of, one of the big key points that I hit on when I talk to students and parents is whether or not it's fair for a colleges, whether or not it's fair to weight the ACT so heavily for college admission is something that we could probably debate forever, but the fact, the thing we can't debate is that it is used by every college, as Ms. Ruri just said, to, to admit a student in. And so I, I tell the parents and the students that one of our jobs is to open up as many doors as possible for their students, and one way we can open doors is by preparing for that assessment. And um, I think the direct elected does that. And I think if that's kind of what you're getting on this rate, yes, that is true. And, and some of the stuff I, I, I probably knew and knew when I was here, but I want to just try to validate that it's still accurate. We we are the largest fee feeder to ICC on my central college. Is that correct? My knowledge, yes. Yeah, um, one of the things that at being in meetings and those things that the concern was that we were that students were going over there and taking non-credit bearing classes that required them to pay for those but they were non-credit bearing classes and they were looking for us to find ways to eliminate that do we have any we don't have any data yet but are we planning to try to find data on this because class of 2014 was a pilot class and in the future are we going to track to see if we have less and less of that going on with our graduates it, it, we do look at that data when it comes to us every year, but you're right, up until this point, we've not obviously really tied that to any of this intervention. But yes, when we get that from ICC, we will. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? This time I'd recognize anyone in the public that would like to address the board uh, on, on this item. I would ask that you keep your comments to, to five minutes. Come to the podium. Please state your name. Good evening. My name is Candace Schlitz, and first of all, I want to applaud the administration and the board for being proactive and for doing what you can to help our students be more successful. I have questions, several actually, about ten, but I won't be able to get ten questions in in five minutes. So I'm going to give a few of them now, and then I'll just be asked to put on the board agenda for next month. And I want to be able to get the rest of my questions answered. The first question I have, and I do not expect any answers tonight, I'm just going to ask the question, if you need more time to get the data, please tell me so and I'm okay with that. First question is, regarding the failure rate with your math and English courses, um, I'm asking, was there an analysis done to determine why the students were in fact failing the math and English courses? Aside from the fact that it's assumed they weren't ready for high school, could it have been a fact of homework completion? testing strategies, their ability to take the test, or their attendance here at school. Does the answer count towards my five minutes? <laughs> uh, I, I think it would be better for you just just make your presentation okay. and then, and then they can get back with you with the... That'd be great. Thank you so much. Um, the next question I have is if the summer school class, I'm referring to the English opportunity now, is being offered, and I applaud you for offering students the opportunity to expand their schedules. Would it be possible for that class, as I understand it now, the English one enrichment and English second semester enrichment are offered at the same time? So for example, a student who is taking English one enrichment takes it in the morning and English two in the afternoon. Would it be possible to be considered to have them take the English one elective slash enrichment the first half of summer school? And if that child is deemed to be successful, perhaps have that child eliminated from having to take the second semester, much like you would do during the school year. The second, or excuse me, the third question I have uh, is regarding the English curriculum. I have a great deal of regard for the English teachers here at Pekin High, having been alone myself. Um, I would like to know what materials were used to devise that English elective curriculum. The uh, fourth question I have is regarding the data on the directed elective. I can appreciate that you probably did have an increase in the passing rate with the additional attention paid by the children, to the children by the teachers. Um, of that I have no doubt and I apologize for that. Could I please have a copy 
of the increase in their test scores regarding the plan and the ACT, if at all possible, with that first two years as a result of the directed elective, meaning is there a substantial and significant increase in their test scores towards college and career readiness? And the final question I have is regarding the math elective, excuse me, the enrichment. It's my understanding that students who have been enrolled in Algebra 1 have the option, and I applaud you for that, to go in the Algebra 1A class and taking the directed elective. This goes with Mrs. Hoheimer's question in the sense is if the math directed elective piggybacks on what is taught in the class, I find it difficult to believe that what's taught in Algebra 1 and what's taught in Algebra 1A on any given day can be support, supported by the directed elective unless those students are separated into separate sections of the directed elective because if you mix Algebra 1 and Algebra 1A students in the same course of the directed elective, chances are those students have received different instruction, albeit maybe only a couple days. Um, the directed elective materials might find it difficult with one teacher to support students in different math classes at the same time within the same class. So those are the only questions I have, because that's my five. Thanks. Thank you. Other comments? Uh, my name is uh, Bob Johnson, and I've spoken to a couple of the board members previously and some of the administration as well. And just as I look through this, uh, it seems like we're trying to reinvent the wheel to a certain extent with some of the, uh, and I understand it's uh, mandates that come down from the government, and that's not necessarily an easy thing to deal with. Um, the Illinois State Be Board of Education has a lot of material on the website, and a lot um, I received off the website from Mr. DePatis, and I've just followed the links to that. Um, and it just seems that we are doing uh, our directed elective or uh, enrichment a lot different than what the Illinois State Board of Education lays out. And I know you don't have to follow it guideline uh, word for word, but just take for example uh, the, the number or percentage of kids that are supposed to be into these directed elective classes. Uh, the State Board of Education has a triangle similar to what they showed earlier, but it broke down on how many students were supposed to be in each level of that. The tier one is supposed to be 80 to 90 percent of the students. The number it's supposed to be in tier two is only supposed to be, uh, I think it was 80, or I mean, sorry, it was supposed to be 10 to 15 percent. And then the tier three, which is up higher, is only supposed to be one to five percent of the student body. Um, I'm just wondering why we're not trying to expand our core curriculum to encompass those kids and help those kids that are, and make it the 80% to 90% that the State Board of Education is putting down, that that's how many should be basically uh, educated just in the core curriculum and not taking extra classes. Um, the other, some of the data that was on there too with the English data, I agree, you guys are doing a great job with the, the chart that was up there with the students that are uh, three, four, and five, and even two years behind grade level. I don't know what number of students that is um, that are, would be an incoming freshman, but of the students who are reading at or above grade level, and I know it's a little hard to see on the, uh, on the thing here, uh, there's not very much improvement shown in the students who are reading at grade level or behind by one grade level. Um, and I, I wonder what the number of students there, if that's a large number of students, um, that's probably encompassing some of the bubble kids that was brought up earlier, and it just doesn't show that it's improving that uh, aspect of the student body, whereas, yeah, the ones that are farther behind are showing a lot more improvement from this program, which just for me being a lay person looking at it, looks like that's what the State Board of Education was trying to get, is get these kids who are so far behind back up to grade level, or closer, you may not be able to get them to grade level, but get them closer to grade level, so that they can be successful uh, in the upper level junior senior classes. Um, I just really think as a taxpayer, I assumed that we would be following the State Board of Education guidelines. And it just seems that we are way, uh, and even ad admittedly from some people in the administration I've talked to, are not very in step with those guidelines. Uh, but again, I, I also applaud trying to improve the programs and improve the education here. Um, I just think that we're kind of lumping a bunch of uh, kids into one barrel when maybe they shouldn't be lumped in the same barrel, I guess, 
Please go to Senate. Thank you. Other comments? Administration, anything else? Board members, anything? We'll have those uh, questions and we'll get we'll the outcome because. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. to our next item on the agenda, which is policies for the first reading. Mrs. Hallmeyer? Yes, the policy committee is presenting nine policies for a first reading. Uh, please note that eight additional policies listed on the page number to the right are not included because suggested press changes considered during review were confined to just footnotes, legal citations, and administrative procedure references because current district policy differs significantly from the press version and it was decided not to make suggested textual changes or because current district policy was deemed sufficient without without suggested press changes to the to the text in addition one policy and one exhibit attached to it were held over for a future meeting to allow time for uh, review by our board attorney uh, we have Policy 2030, 2.110, 4.30, 5.10, 5.10, 5.180, 5.190, 7.70, and 7.190, uh, bringing it to the board to, to lay over. Policies 2.30, 2.110, 4.30, 5.10, 5.35, 5.180, 5.190, and 7.190 as presented for action at a future date. The motion has been made on behalf of the committee, requires no second, that these policies be laid over for action at our next meeting. Questions or comments on the policies as presented at this time? Very not, Mr. White, call the roll, please. Oheimer? Aye. Bill? Aye. Howard? Aye. O'Neill? Aye. Rui? Aye. Wrigley? Aye. Allison Rainey? Aye. Motion carries. Policies are laid over. Item 5.5, possible PCHS art program trip to New York City. Mr. DePates. We have uh, four independent students uh, in art that are requesting permission. Uh, they are involved in the Vans, and that's Vans as in the shoes, Vans um, custom culture competition uh, that they are submitting. Uh, for their designs for a new set of van shoes. If they are selected as finalists, they will be traveling to New York City uh, in June of 2014, and the request is that these students would be allowed to go if, if, if in fact, they do make the finals. Per the request from the administration, the grant board approved to permit staff and students in the PCHS art program to attend the van's custom culture competition and finals to be held in New York City in early to mid June 2014 as presented, should students qualify for that final round judging. Second. Motion by Mrs. Hoheimer. Second. Second by Mr. O'Neill. Questions or comments? This is what, the third year or fourth year that they've had? Third year. Third year. Other questions or comments? Mr. White, call the roll, please. Oheimer? Aye. O'Neill? Aye. Hill? Aye. Howard? Aye. Rui? Aye. Wrigley? Aye. Allison Green? Aye. Motion carries. Item 5.6, band program to trip to Orlando. The, uh, the marching band is uh, planning a uh, trip for spring break of 2015, which is April 6th to the 10th. Uh, next school year. Um, part of that trip that you can see on, starting on page 183 of your materials as an itinerary of that. Uh, part of that will be uh, marching in a parade at, at Disneyland as well as some other um, academic or, um, yeah, academic and uh, enrichment things that the students will be doing while they're there. Um, and as you can see on the uh, agenda it's recommended for approval to permit the staff and students the PCHS band program to attend Disney. Magic Music Days as part of a trip to Orlando, Florida during the spring break of 2015. 
per the request from the administration, to grant the approval for the band trip to uh, Orlando next spring. So moved. Motion by Mr. Wrigley. Second. Second by Mrs. Hoheimer. Questions or comments? Are there actually two different like packages listed here? The, the itineraries, there were two separate ones that were, I believe you have there, I'm gonna double check. Um, there was one that was looking at whether they would um, take buses and, and drive down, or there was one that they would be flying down. And um, what we're looking at is the one that they would be flying down because of the time constraints. If they were to be driving uh, motor coaches, taking charter buses, they would actually have to miss some days of school as opposed to just being gone during spring break. And then is there two different hotels listed here as well? There might be, be just because of the... Uh, I think it was an option. I think that it, it's a cost. I, I think it was the cost difference. Yes. Okay. Did, did I read this right, that they're going to book one set of flights and then if they get space on Southwest, they're going to cancel the other flights and book Southwest? There's something about, my understanding is that with the Southwest, that the, the, they're able to get their instruments and stuff on there at a lesser cost. The Southwest doesn't charge you extra for the two bags. So there's a, they're able to get a, a cheaper rate, I think, if they're able to get on Southwest. And there won't be an issue with um, negating that many flights, seats on the flight? That's that's what Bob Rogers Travel, that's what they're, that's what they have, they're working with that company to do. So Bob Rogers Travel handles all those arrangements. Other questions, comments? I do have one other, I'm sorry. Um, it said that in there that if uh, they're able, they're not able to get on a flight, they can take their instruments, and somebody's gonna drive the instruments down their two parents. So would that be the bus, the band bus, the band truck, the trailer? I believe that's what the, the No, they will rent a, a trailer for right. So it won't be our? Well, they'll be renting in. So if something would happen with all the instruments and everything, that would, we would have a responsibility for that? Right. Their original proposal was that they would want to take our trailer and have a parent haul that down. I thought that was probably not the best idea um, based on the fact that I mean, anything can happen. Whereas if you rent a U-Haul or some other rental car, or something happens, they can service it, they can or swap it out or something like that. That's worst case scenario if they can't get on Southwest, but that is the game plan if they can. Okay, thank you. Other questions? We have a motion and a second. Mr. White, come roll, please. Wrigley? Aye. Oheimer? Aye. Bill? Aye. Howard? Aye. O'Neill? Aye. Rui? Aye. Allison Green? Aye. Motion carries. Item 5.7, Mental Illini Conference Academic Awards. Mr. Dupatis. Yeah, you can see on page 195 of your materials the list of students, student athletes that uh, receive Mental Illini Conference Academic Awards. Uh, it's quite a lengthy list, but I would ask that those names um, of the 2013-2014 Mental Illini Conference Academic Award recipients be a matter of record as presented. For the request for the administration, a motion would be in order. So moved. Motion by Mr. O'Neill, second by Mr. Hill. Questions, comments? Congratulations to those students. Mr. White, call roll, please. O'Neill? Aye. Bill? Aye. Oheimer? Aye. Howard? Aye. Rui? Aye. Wrigley? Aye. Allison Green? Aye. Motion carries. Item 5.8, resolutions for the sale of Building Trades House. Mr. Dupatis. And we are once again coming to the completion of the Building Trades House out of Deerfield Estates. Uh, I was out there last week and it's looking very good. The, the siding is just about complete, probably should be complete later in the week depending on the weather. Um, the, the, the kids have done a very, uh, very admirable job of what they've done. Um, for those of you that are interested, Sunday, May 18th will be the open house for that from one to three. Uh, I encourage you all to come along and, and take a look and see the job they've done. Um, the recommendation is that uh, have a resolution for the sale of the house to set a minimum bid price of $212,900 for the sale of that property. Mm -hmm. Motion by Mr. Howard, second by Mrs. Hoheimer. To adopt the resolution found on page 196 for the sale of lot 160 in Deerfield Estates, section 6B, subdivision Tazewell County, Illinois, commonly known as 1804 Hunters Trace, Pekin, Illinois, 61554, uh, for the minimum 
price of $212,900 as presented. Questions, comments? Mr. White, call the roll, please. Howard? Aye. Holheimer? Aye. Hill? Aye. Neal? Aye. Rui? Aye. Wrigley? Aye. Allison Green? Aye. Motion carries. Uh, the next item, the purchase of property, uh, that is being pulled from the agenda. We're not prepared for that uh, this evening. And we'll come back on a, on a later agenda. Item 5.10, textbook request for the 2014-2015 school year. Mrs. Owens. Um, last month, I gave you a list of possible textbook requests for the 14-15 school year. That list um, looks very similar since it has not changed. It's on page 198. We're asking for books, new books for career and tech education class, for our health occupations class. Um, obviously, we have to keep up because it is a dual credit class. That's something that we have to update when um, expected. Um, we also have new textbooks for an AP European history class that we are offering for the first time next year, which is a go, so we're excited about that, as well as an AP economics class, which will be offered second semester. Um, um, the, the textbook that we're purchasing will be, hopefully, if the program continues and expands, that AP economics can be offered both first and second semester. That textbook will be good for both sections of that AP um, economics. And then um, it's about, been about eight to 10 years since we've updated our sociology text. Lots of, lots of things have happened in the world since then. Um, and so we are going to uh, ask for permission to update those. So I would like to recommend about board approval to adopt textbooks requested by the CTE and Social Studies Departments for use in designated courses beginning with the 2014-2015 school year as presented. For the request for the administration, a motion would be so in order. Second. <laughs> motion by Mr. Hill, second by Mrs. Hillheimer to approve the textbook request. Questions, comments? Mr. White, call the roll, please. Hill. Aye. Hoheimer? Aye. Howard? Aye. O'Neill? Aye. Rui? Aye. Wrigley? Aye. Allison Green? Aye. Motion carries. Textbooks may be purchased. Item 5.11, request board permission to sell a miscellaneous district property. Mrs. Schaefer. Some time ago we came to you and accepted a, a donation actually from Mr. Walraven in our math department um, of a 1999 Ford F-150 truck. The um, automotive technology program has refurbished that truck and it is now um, um, asking permission to um, sell the truck with a minimum bid of $1,500. So we would hope um, um, that we can get the appropriate advertisements in the paper this month and come back to you in May with a potential buyer. So the recommendation tonight would be board approval to grant permission to sell um, miscellaneous district property as presented at a minimum bid of $1,500. Mm -hmm. Motion by Mr. Howard, second by Mrs. Holheimer to grant permission to sell miscellaneous district property, specifically the 1999 Ford F-150 truck, and set a minimum bid of $1,500. Questions, comments? Call the roll, please. Howard? Aye. Holheimer? Aye. Hill? Aye. O'Neill? Aye. Rui? Aye. Wrigley? Aye. Allison Green? Aye. Motion carries. Item 5.12, staff and student workers for summer 2014 employment, Mrs. Schaefer. Each year we come to you with a list of um, uh, Pekin High staff and Pekin High students to employ for our summer summer work around the campus. So tonight we would um, request board approval for um, uh, the following, I'll just read the following staff workers um, that would begin potentially the first day of work would be June 10th with, through August 8th at $11 per hour. Those individuals are Kathy Beach, Chase Bushman, Rita Buss, Erica Gilmore, Stephanie Harris, John Kennedy, Melanie Morris, Bryce Reese, Ashley Fretke, Deb Smith, and Amy Taylor. The list of student workers that we would recommend for summer employment would also begin June 10th through August 8th at a rate of $8.25 per hour are Isaac Arsenault, Terry Biggs, Jordan Bowman, Zach Klingbeal, Austin Lynn, Shea Morrell, Corey Schultz, Andy Saban, Brett Smith, and Zach Smith. The recommendation would be board approval to employ the summer staff and student workers for the dates of hourly wage rates as presented. Mm. Motion by Mr. Howard. Second. Second by Mr. Wrigley. Questions, comments? Mrs. Schaefer, would you be so kind as to take a minute and explain 
the library clean out, which is something new? Sure. We, um, this is new for this summer. We actually um, are in the process of trying to um, assess our library situation. We're, we're at the point where we know we need to do some remodeling in there. So we're going to take the opportunity this summer to actually clean out some old hardback books and shelving and things that have kind of accumulated over the years um, and also things that students are not are not using anymore. And so we're going to have two staff members and a couple students that are going to work strictly in the library this summer to try to get some materials and things cleaned out of there so then we can take a, take a better look at what we have and what we need to move forward as we continue to have a plan developed from the library remodeling. Ultimately leading to better utilization of that space, right? Right, correct. Good idea. Yeah. Other questions, comments? Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Mr. White, call the roll, please. Howard? Aye. Wrigley? Aye. Bill? Aye. Oheimer? Aye. O'Neill? Aye. Rui? Aye. Alice Marie? Aye. Motion carries. Item 5.3, yearbook contract. Mrs. Shaver? We were up for um, uh, renewal to take our um, yearbook contract out for four proposals again, so we did that and we received four um, proposals back. They came from um, Taylor, Herb Jones, Walsworth, and Jostens. Actually, Ms. Brucker and Mr. Steger reviewed those bids. We currently have Herb Jones. Um, the bids all came back. Um, Herb Jones and Jostens were competitive. Taylor was, was quite a bit higher, and Walsworth actually was um, considerably less. Con and, and we've had experience, I, and, and three years ago, I think I sat here and said the same thing, that we've had walls work in the past and didn't um, get the type of service that we had expected, and we actually broke that kind We did not renew them. Um, typically what we do is we recommend one year with up to two additional renewals, and in the past we've done all three years with, with our past contractors. We did not do that with them. That was the year we actually went to Taylor. Um, so the recommendation actually tonight is to stay with Herb Jones, Ms. Brucker, Ms. Mr. Steger, who have been very happy with their service. They've done a great job and produced a great yearbook. Um, none, of the, none of the bids would change what we're recommending to charge for the yearbook, so that will stay the same. So the recommendation tonight would be to approve a one-year contract for the 14-15 school year with Herb Jones renewable for up to two additional years upon satisfactory performance. Further request for the administration? Motion will be so in order. Motion by Mrs. Hoheimer. Second. Second by Mr. O'Neill. To approve for a one-year contract for the 2014-2015 school year with Herb Jones, we know for up to two additional years upon satisfactory performance for the yearbook. Questions, comments? Mr. So White, call the roll, please. Hoheimer. Aye. O'Neill. Aye. Bill. Aye. Howard. Aye. Rui. Aye. Ridley. Aye. Allison. Aye. Motion carries. Item 5.14, renewal of the contract with the third party administrator for health insurance. Mrs. Schaefer. On page 199 of your materials is the um, renewal information that Simonis has pr had presented to Mr. DePatis and I when we met. Um, as you know, this is a June 1st effective date, so typically they come to us with, with rates um, in April. And we actually um, have seen a little bit of a decrease in the fixed rate that we that we have um, um, going into the 14-15 school year. Um, last year, or last yeah, last year we had a, a fixed rate of about $310,700. This year, it equates to $279,710. A lot of that, if you'll remember, we changed our over 65 retirees onto a Humana plan. So the majority of that decreases is strictly because of we lost lives off of this plan and they got moved to Humana. Um, but we still felt it was a, a, a great bid to come back to us. You know, in the wake of everything that's going on in healthcare, we were pleased with it. So um, they did a good job um, getting a, getting us a good rate again for the 14-15 for the plan year. So the recommendation tonight would be for the board to approve the renewal of the district's contract with United Healthcare River Valley as our third party administrator for health insurance effective June 1st, 2014 at a fixed cost of $110.47 per employee per month as presented. For the request from the administration, a motion would be in order to approve the request. Mm -hmm. Motion by Mr. Howard, second by Mrs. Wellheimer. 
Questions or comments? A roll, please. Howard? Aye. Joel Hammer? Aye. Phil? Aye. O'Neill? Aye. Rui? Aye. Wrigley? Aye. Allison Reed? Aye. Motion carries. Item 5.15 is the renewal of the contract with the third party administrator for ancillary benefits. On page 200 of your materials is the renewal for the ancillary benefits with the district. As you know, we have a different third party administrator that ha handles our um, dental life insurance and vision benefits. Um, what the district's paying for is, is the dental benefit that they administer for, for us. Um, the rate did go up a little bit. Um, the last three years of this contract, they've left it status quo at three dollars and ten cents it went up this year to three dollars and forty one cents which is a little over a thousand dollars a year for us <coughs> to administer that program so it's still very economical to the district and we've had no issues with guardian and, and we're pleased with their service so the recommendation tonight would be for the board to approve the renewal of the district's contract with guardian as our third party administrator for ancillary benefits effective june 1st 2014 at a fixed cost of three dollars and forty one cents per employee per month as presented mm -hmm. Motion by Mr. Howard, second by Mrs. Hohammer to approve the request from the administration on the contract with Guardian as our third party administrator for ancillary benefits effective June 1st, 2014 at a fixed cost of $3.41 per employee per month as presented. Questions or comments? Ms. White, call the roll, please. Howard? Aye. Hohammer? Aye. Bill? Aye. O'Neill? Aye. Rui? Aye. Wrigley? Aye. Allison Green? Aye. Motion carries. Reports, resignations, Mrs. Hohammer. Uh, yes, I have four resignations. Uh, the first one is Aoi, Aoi, Carl, teacher for the math slash special education department, effective June 9th. Mary Hudson, assistant student council advisor, effective at the end of the 2013-14 school year. Ashley Sharp. Head Student Council Advisor, effective at the end of 2013-14 school year, and Angela Wilson, teacher for the math slash special education department, effective April 4, 2014. Thank you. Policy Committee, Mrs. O'Hearn. We did not meet this month. Operations and Maintenance Committee, Mr. Howard. I know you met. Absolutely. Operations and Maintenance met earlier this evening in the superintendent's office and uh, we never have a shortage of things to talk about. Um, I'll just bring you up to speed on some of the things that are underway and, and uh, looking like they're in pretty good shape. Um, the first two items uh, come out of district funds. One is the stadium locker room, and I gotta tell you, if you haven't been in the boys football locker room lately, and some of you ladies probably never, you need to stick your head in there and take a look because we have all new um, red lockers and we've updated the restroom facilities in there which were uh, dark ages at best and so we have new um, restroom facilities and they have red petitions dividing them off and I just I'm so proud of that locker room I can't stand it my oldest boy played football in this high school for four years and I can't wait to get him home sometime <laughs> and show it to him he'll probably kill me uh, <laughs> We're, we've been working, uh, Mr. Bonnet and the Buildings and Ground people have been working on the digital controls and they're about half done and, and uh, a large part of that was under a maintenance grant. Uh, Custer Stout building clips, they're about half done where the building uh, is moving and like separating. Uh, the H building cooling tower roof is done. Digital controls in C building are about half done. There's a bunch of concrete work that needs to be done at the stadium, and, and uh, the, the jury is still out on that one. There's spaying of the concrete where the concrete tends to crater and explode, and then that leads to further deterioration of the concrete. But uh, we are working on that one diligently and, and hope to have a solution in the near future. We also have issues with uh, G building roof leaking, and uh, we're looking at what will be a very costly venture and we're looking at possibly piecemealing it to make it more affordable and within budgets. All those, all those items that I've just list, listed are in the 2014 year and uh, the majority of them um, fall under health life safety. Other items that we're looking at are restroom remodels. 
uh, retube the boilers, which is covered by a grant in part. Welding hoods, that's a big one. Um, in right out down that hallway, we need new welding hoods for the welding area. And uh, we're not making a lot of progress on that, but we expect to make progress and have the welding hoods for the next school year. We're also working on G-building electrical panels, F-building electrical panels, and G-building doors. And isn't this exciting? <laughs> not, not, but it's necessary. Um, in the very near future, we'll be going over the facility audit, and that's where we interact with the faculty and staff so that we can determine which rooms are gonna get what attention and what order and, and what movement needs to take place for that to happen. Um, I guess that's about all I've got. It's kind of helter-skelter. Mr. Riggle, did I miss anything? No, you hit uh, just about every item on that. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions of Mr. Howard? Let's put him on the spot. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, LMRC did not meet because there were no agenda items. Student Achievement Committee, Mr. DeFates. Uh, Student Achievement Committee met uh, earlier this month, and uh, we continued our discussions around uh, issues that we're trying to see that affect uh, graduation rate, uh, student achievement, uh, freshman uh, failure rates, or just in general, uh, what we can try and do to increase our student achievement at the building. Uh, we're kind of in the beginning stages of those discussions, and trying to see what the issues are so that we can try and come up with possible solutions. Thank you. At this time, annually, the board reorganizes for the coming year, and I would ask for nominations for the election of Office of President of the Board of Education for the next year. I would like to nominate Larry Howard for president. Nomination for Larry Howard has been placed in nomination for the Office of President. Are there any other nominations? Hearing no other nominations, I would ask for a motion to close nominations and to elect by unanimous consent uh, Larry Howard is president of the Board of Education for the next year. So moved. Motion by Mr. Wrigley. Second by Mrs. Hoheimer. Mr. White, call the roll, please. Wrigley? Aye. Hoheimer? Aye. Hill? Aye. Howard? Present. O'Neill? Aye. Rui? Aye. Allison Reed? Aye. Motion is carried. Mr. President, the rest is yours. You said that with too much glee in your voice. <laughs> Thank you. Before um, we proceed, there's a couple items I want to touch on real quickly. And first of all, I want to mention to my board members that prior to the next regularly scheduled meeting, uh, it's my hope that we can have uh, committee assignments in place. So if any of you have any thoughts or suggestions along those lines, feel free to contact me. The second thing I'd like to say to you is um, I'd like to ask that everyone remain seated where they are until we have finished the election of the officers because to do otherwise it has the potential to look like Keystone Cops. So I think it would be more orderly if we stayed in place until we've completed the officer elections. And then lastly, uh, something that gives me personal great joy, and I'm sure my fellow board members as well, uh, Mr. Alessandrini's got quite a collection of gavels over the years. And I found through the grapevine that he doesn't want any more gavels. So, I have a beautiful plaque. <laughs> And it says, Joseph T. Alessandrini, President, Board of Education, Pekin Community High School, District 303. And it lists all his years that he's been president, which is amazing in and of itself. Presented in great, great, grateful appreciation for nine years of dedicated leadership to the district and its students, staff, and Board of Education this 28th day of April 2014. Please join me in a round of applause as a sign of appreciation for this fine man.
next item. I would be seeking nomination for the election of the Office of Vice President of the Board of Education. Mr. President, I'd like to nominate Karen Bullhammer for Vice President. Thank you, Mr. Hill. Are there further nominations? I would then recommend um, a motion that, that we um, close nominations and elect Mrs. Holheimer, Vice President, by unanimous consent. So moved. Second. Thank you, Mr. Allison Greedy. Motion by Mr. Allison Greedy, second by Mr. Hill. Mr. White, would you call the roll, please? Allison Greedy. Aye. Hill. Aye. Holheimer. Present. O'Neill. Aye. Rui. Aye. Wrigley. Aye. Howard. Aye. Motion carries. Congratulations, Mrs. Hohan. Continuing on, I would seek nominations for the election of the Office of Secretary of the Board of Education. Do we have nominations? Mr. President, it be my honor to nominate Mr. Hill for the Office of Secretary of the Board of Education. Thank you, Mr. Wrigley. Are there other nominations for the Office of Secretary? Hearing none, then I would once again seek a motion to close nominations and elect Mr. Eric Hill, Secretary of the Board, by unanimous consent. So moved. Thank you, Mr. O'Neill. Second by Mrs. O'Han. Mr. White, would you call the roll, please? O'Neill. Aye. O'Heimer. Aye. Hill. Present. Rui. Aye. Wrigley. Aye. Allison Reedy. Aye. Howard. Aye. Congratulations, Mr. Hill. Now, if you want to play musical chairs, you may. Vice President here. Secretary here. <laughs> it's been a while since you've been over there, hasn't it? It gets him close to Mr. White. He yeah, has, I can keep Mr. White alive. He enjoys that neighborhood. Ask Mr. White if he wants you to know <laughs> No. Oh, do oh, you want Mr. Roy next to you? <laughs> next item. We would need a motion establishing a calendar containing the dates for the regular meetings of the Pekin Community High School District Number 303 Board of Education for the 2014-2015 school year. Mr. President, I make that motion as found on page 202, supported material. Thank you, Mr. Allison Drini. Do we have a second? Second. Is that Mr. Wrigley? I think uh, Mrs. Holheimer got in before I had it. Well, it sounded pretty masculine to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, then Karen Holheimer it is. Questions, comments, or discussion? Hearing none, Mr. White, would you call the roll, please? Allison Greeny? Aye. Bill Heimer? Aye. Bill? Aye. O'Neill? Aye. Rui? Aye. Wrigley? Aye. Howard? Aye. Motion carries. Meeting dates established. Next item. We need to adopt the policies, procedures, and resolutions adopted by action of previous PCHS District 303 Boards of Education. Mr. President, I recommend that this board adopt all policies, procedures, and resolutions adopted by actions of previous boards of education. Thank you, Mr. Wrigley. Do we have a second? second. Thank you, Mrs. Holheimer. Motion by Mr. Wrigley, second by Mrs. Holheimer. Do we have questions, comments, or discussion? Hearing none, Mr. White, would you call the roll, please? Wrigley. Aye. Holheimer. Aye. Allison Green. Aye. Hill. Aye. O'Neill. Aye. Rui. Aye. Howard. Aye. Motion carries. Policies, procedures, and resolutions are hereby adopted. Next item. We need to establish the fiscal year for Pekin Community High School as July 1 through June 30, and I would be seeking a motion to that effect. So moved. Thank you, Mr. O'Neill. Second. Second. Thank you, Mr. Alessandrini. Questions, comments, or discussion? Hearing none, Mr. White, have we worn you out yet? Uh -huh. 
Call the roll, please. O'Neill. Aye. Allison Green. Aye. Hill. Aye. Hoheimer. Aye. Rui. Aye. Wrigley. Aye. Howard. Aye. Motion carries. The fiscal year is set. At this point in the agenda, we have an item entitled Future Agenda Items. That's a point where board members can bring up something they would like to see on a future agenda. Do we have any items that meet that criteria? Moving on, announcements by the president. We have quite a few here, so bear with me. Um, first announcement, I want to point out that Dragon Pride will be held this coming Wednesday, April 30th, from 6 to 8 o'clock in Hawkins Gym and the vicinity around the gym. A career fair has been added this year, same place but running from 6 to 7.30. As a part of Dragon Pride, an award ceremony will take place at 7.30 p.m. for students who have received nominations for leadership, academics, citizenship, and effort from each of the departments. If you've never attended this function, uh, I think it's one of the highlights of the year. It's just, it's incredible to interact one-on-one, -on -one, face to face with a lot of our students and see the excitement that they bring to the things that they're doing. It's just, it's incredible at the, at, at the least. Next item, the Illinois Association, of School, Illinois Association of School Board Central Illinois Valley Division Summer Governing Meeting is scheduled for Wednesday, May 7th, the Lariat Steakhouse in Peoria. If you have not already done so, please RSVP to Mr. White if you plan on attending that event. Next item. This is always one of the highlights of the board too, in my opinion. The 2014 induction ceremony for the National Honor Society will take place Monday, May the 5th, beginning at 7 p.m. in FM Peterson Theater with a reception to follow in the cafeteria. That's another exciting event. The next one, Mr. DeVate has mentioned it, but I'll mention it quickly. Open House Building Trades, May the 18th from 1 to 3. Next item, Senior Academic Awards Recognition Ceremony will begin at 5 p.m. on Thursday, May 22nd, which is then followed by Baccalaureate at 7 in the FM Peterson Theater. And both of those are exciting things to witness as well. Next item, commencement is scheduled for Sunday, May the 25th at 2 o'clock, hopefully in the stadium. Next item, the district's annual retirement luncheon will begin at 12 <coughs> noon on Thursday, June 5th in the cafeteria. If you haven't notified people that you're attending, please do so. The next regularly scheduled meeting of the Board of Education is scheduled for Tuesday, May the 27th at 6.30 p.m. The fourth Monday of the month, May the 26th, is Memorial Day, and so that meeting has been relocated. At this point in the process, I would be looking for a motion for a closed session regarding the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees of the public body or legal counsel for the public body, including hearing testimony on a complaint lodged against an employee of the public body or against legal counsel for the public body to determine its validity. Do I have such a motion? Second. Thank you, Mr. Hill. Second by Mrs. Hoheimer. Mr. White, would you call the roll, please? Hill? Aye. Hoheimer? Aye. Allison Greeny? Aye. O'Neill? Aye. Rui? Aye. Wrigley? Aye. Howard? Aye. Motion carries. The board will go into closed session, but I need to inform those of you in the audience that at the conclusion of this closed session, there will be no board business con conducted. So for all intents and purposes, this meeting is technically in a state of adjournment. Thank you all for coming tonight.